911, what's your emergency? Right across the street from us. Just like blew up. Where? Corner of Masters and um, 16. Masters and 16. The gas station blew yeah, up? The BP station. How do you, the building is on fire? Yes, ma'am. Uh, something just blew up yeah, on, on Masters Drive. Hi, there's a fire on uh, 16 and it yes. looks like it's on a... Uh, it's a gas station explosion. Yeah. Yes, we've got wow. multiple units going. On the side of the street that needs help. Yes, ma'am, we've got multiple units coming. Looks like I'm across the street. Looks like they're getting ready to pour some water. No, no, no. Yell at them. Know. Don't pour water. Ma'am, ma'am. GMC said do not pour water. I see, I see one of your men at the corner of the street, a fireman. Okay. I don't know if he can come over and assist. There's a big group of people. Okay. Oh, there's water. All right. Let's do this. You gonna wait? There's a big freaking noise. It's about to explode. There's a big thing. All right, get away. Go, go, take cover. Get away. We'll get them. We'll tell them where the is, okay? We need to go through the light that they're at right now. Through the light. Ma'am, do you know if anybody is in the building? I don't. I've seen, they've seen them dragging someone out. All I see is the black smoke. I think it's the gas pump. Okay. I mean, it's real big black smoke. Michael, can I have a kiss? Can I have a kiss? The fire in 2011 was literally a hot mess. He came home the next day, and one thing that struck me is he said, uh, if anything ever happens to me, I want you to look into it. I haven't done it in a while, so let me get it warm up. So now does the house look familiar? Mm -hmm. so it looks like my house. It is your house. Let me start there. Oh, don't start what? What is it? Hmm? What is it? It's your house. Ooh, it's our house. It's our house. Our house. Who's that guy? It is a very, very, very fine house. I don't know, who is that guy? Your name is Sean. Yep. And who is he? He's my son. Correct. Good job. He's brave. He's not like me. Oh, Mr. Man, he ran into fires for 30 years. How could you say that? When I knew something was wrong was when he had had trouble performing a task on a, on a very small routine scene that was so second nature to him that uh, even, even without the mind working, it's a muscle memory thing. That, and, and for him not to be able to complete that task really set off a red flag for me that something was wrong with him. I asked him where an air pack was and he said it was in the truck. And I walked over to the truck, and the air pack was not in the truck. I walked back to him, and I said, hey, that air pack's not in the truck. He said, yes, it is. I, I put it there. I know it's there. And I said, come show me. And he walked over to the truck with me, and he pointed at the seat where the air pack would sit. And he said, it's right there. And I said, no, it's not. It's not there. He said, yes, it is. And we kind of got into a little argument over this air pack. And I actually climbed up into the truck and reached in and showed him that the air pack was missing. And he just became very confused and kind of like, oh, I don't know, and kind of shrugged it off and, and walked away, kind of upset. And uh, I think that was my last shift with Mike. Shortly after that, it might have been one more shift and, and he, was, he was done. Hi, Daddy. Hi. What you got there? I got a precious little 
baby right now. Him. But when he cries, he's not a precious little <laughs> baby. He's a monster. Do you, do you remember the gas station explosion? Yeah, it was so far on. It was hangover time. Because he had it backed up and it showed some brains. It was 2011, and uh, I was riding up in charge of uh, uh, the department that day. I was a captain on uh, engine, engine uh, 43. And uh, I remember we had two engines downtown that day. Um, we had actually gotten called down the street from the firehouse for a really large oak tree that had fallen on um, four, I think four vehicles. And I remember Dustin saying that, uh, that there was something, some kind of call going on. Uh, of course, I couldn't hear the, you know, I couldn't hear the radio at the time because we were running the chainsaw and, uh, you know, picking, picking limbs and things up. And um, I remember him saying that he didn't know what it was, but it was really bad. Uh, we could already see the flames over the trees. And they said it was the uh, BP gas station. Well, immediately as we made our way to US-1, we could hear uh, another engine that had pulled in behind us. And it was the crew of our second truck that was downtown St. Augustine. And uh, as we rounded the corner on the 16, um, the fire was incredibly intense. And all I could think was, you, you probably need to call your wife, you know, because uh, this, is, this, is, uh, this is probably one of the biggest fires you've ever gone to. As we stopped at the hydrant, um, the engine 46, the next truck behind us came, came right in. So we both uh, arrived, you know, quickly and uh, started going to work. And Mike and uh, Brett came from engine 46 immediately and started grabbing hoses off of our truck. And we're right in the, the you know, I'm going to say probably the worst part of the danger zone of that gas station. It was, it was very chaotic. It was a chaotic scene. There was a lot going on. It was the biggest scene that this county has seen uh, in a long time, or arguably ever. Um, a lot of fire, a lot of hazards. Um, uh, to my knowledge, there was only one injury uh, of a civilian, and that's a miracle uh, based on a scenario. And we were there for hours. It was hard to see because of the amount of black smoke that was billowing over the top of us. It, 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 almost, it almost blacked out the sun. So um, as we had the lines all out, we noticed that the, the, the fire, you know, was just getting like, you know, getting to be like a wall. It was, it was huge. And then all of a sudden, uh, it was like a huge, almost like a whoosh. A huge steel tank that had let go. And somehow, I, I don't know if it was just pure luck, someone was looking out for us, it, it was diverted away from us. All the fire had been diverted away from us from that tank letting go. And the wall of fire probably came within like 30 feet of us and was just just as if it was a wall that was two, 300 feet high in front of us and it was all fire. I told him at that time, I said, I think, listen, I said, we need to move. We need to drop our lines and move. Just let's save the trucks, get the trucks away and move to a safer location. Um, by that time, we had a tremendous amount of uh, personnel and trucks that had arrived and were starting to help. Um, I advised them we needed more water. The one hydrant that we had was way overwhelmed. We needed to, to you know, tap into some more hydrants. Um, the next closest hydrant was probably 900 feet or so. I think we were walking through you know, fuel. Um, I remember when the truck moved, just how nasty the truck was on the outside. It was so filthy. Um, all we could smell was ga gasoline and diesel um, everywhere. And I, I remember once I got out to the roadway, my gear was just saturated. Um, it had so much in it, I, and it was so heavy um, from the water. And, uh, you know, 
it, it seemed like just minutes, but that time, you know, time, it took, it took a while for that to happen, but um, it was just, it was going by so quickly. Uh, more personnel had arrived. Um, we started picking our equipment up and uh, starting to get back into service and returning to the station. So once we arrived back at the station, um, we, we knew immediately we weren't going to be able to use the gear that we had. So we, we all went out looking, you know, to find our spare gear that we had to, you know, replace it and to get cleaned up. Um, I remember even my hair, uh, my hair smelled, you know, of petroleum. Um, the truck, the truck was so dirty and it was so nasty that later on when we, you know, we came back and cleaned it, all the stuff running down the side of it and, you know, all on the outside of it was, uh, was surprising because you didn't realize that all that was going on. Um, and I know when we got back to the station, one of the guys came up to me and he said, uh, <sighs> I remember he was choked up. And he said, Captain, I said, I didn't think we were going to make it. And I told him, I said, I, I, I didn't think we were going to make it either. <sighs> It was such a mess that it was actually the Florida Department of Environmental Protection installed monitoring wells. And to this day, it's still a contaminated area. Every year has required remediation. It was just that bad. There was an auto body repair shop that was attached to the gas station and it also caught on fire in the contents that was in there. When you look back at the photos, it's pretty intense to see that things like entire cars were reduced to little metal skeletons. garage catches on fire and your car catches on fire, you're going to have a lot of benzene released from, from the rubber in the tires. Um, so that's a carcinogen. Um, there's, it's just a, um, it's a complex chemical mixture and it's also got a lot of particulate. So you've got particulate, you've got chemical, you've got, um, you know, carbon monoxide, you know, a lot of stuff that can um, trigger um, their chemical asphyxiants. So carbon monoxide, hydrogen cyanide are both chemical asphyxiants. It shuts down parts of your respiratory system. And if the fuel catches on fire, the main things are benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene, and xylene. Those are the main chemical constituents of gasoline. Plus, you know, the, the, there'll be other stuff, additives and whatever, but those are the, the main things. Um, I think uh, some fires burn hotter than others, depending on the fuel load. That can help uh, drive maybe contaminants in, into, uh, you know, into your skin through absorption as well, if your body's heated up. Um, so, you have, so you have several routes of entry in, um, into your body. Inhalation is one, absorption is another, uh, as far as things being able to get in, penetrate into the body. So one way I could describe it is on a, a, like a drizzly day. That particular day, uh, it was petroleum products. So you've got gasoline and, and diesel and kerosene and everything that that you know, station had stored was coming back down in that, in that almost like rain. But we didn't realize as well, it was all over us and our equipment, even the hose. You know, um, we came back and scrubbed a lot of that stuff to try to clean it and we could smell it. Um, so we knew it was there, even when we didn't see it. I'm a third generation firefighter. Uh, my dad uh, was my hero. I was raised in a fire service, <clears throat> in a fire station, and he was a career firefighter as well. And he, his injuries that he received during his time was, uh, it was back injuries and, and turned into stomach cancer and all kinds of things. It up cost him his life uh, in, in more ways than one. He loved the fire service. He's reforced into retirement, but he had no choice. And then um, 
get a stomach cancer and all of them are related and had COPD from it from the old guys back in the days. They didn't have air packs. They didn't have some of the stuff we have today. For years up until my diagnosis, it, I just remember thinking kind of the what ifs. So I had actually started asking my gynecologist at the age of 35 for mammograms. Normally they don't start until 40 to 45 years old. And they kept kind of blowing me off, like, why would you want a mammogram? You're only 35. And I would say because of my job, I'm, I feel like I'm more at risk for cancer. And about a year before my diagnosis, someone came around to the station selling supplemental cancer policies, and I didn't blink an eye. I signed up immediately because I just felt like cancer was a, a, was a risk. Then when I was diagnosed with the rarest Less than 10% of all breast cancers are triple negative, the type that I had, most aggressive at a young age. I was diagnosed three days after my 38th birthday. They did every test they could on me and they could not, they could not explain why I, a healthy, at the time, young female at the age of 38 would be diagnosed with this rarest and most aggressive form of breast cancer, other than perhaps my job. The glasses are upside down. There you go now. No, honey, you have to flip the blue part back over your head. There you go. There, there, you got it right there. There. Nobody move. <laughs> Nobody moved. That's a good one. It was about three years later, Michael started to have little odd behaviors, um, putting the groceries away in the wrong spot, um, forgetting conversations that we had had. And then as it progressed, it got a little bit worse, he would uh, sit out on the back porch, just kind of sit by himself and I would ask him what was wrong and he, his usual response was he was just really tired. When I thought that something was really wrong was I found a note, a piece of paper that he was putting on his alarm that on one side said work and on the other side said home. So it was a reminder to him when his alarm went off, he would look down at the piece of paper and it would say work. So then he would know that he had to go into shift. So that's when I started to get worried and I tried to start the process of making doctor's appointments. Somebody threw a cigarette out their window at a parking spot and it was a small little mulch fire and, and uh, we pulled up and um, for one thing, you know, like I said, he was one of the best drivers I've ever been around. So placement of a vehicle for him was always what he really excelled at. And in this call, he didn't, um, you know, especially as easy as this placement was because we were using the front jump line, which comes off the bumper and the fire is in front of him and he couldn't, he didn't judge that correctly which would have been an easy one, because a lot of times he could judge where the back of the truck is to be able to put a ladder through power lines. And for something this easy, you know, so be it. Uh, we realized that it was too short, we had to move the truck. And he couldn't do it. He, he didn't know what to do. And, and that's where I knew that just something wasn't right. One day, uh, I was at the, uh, the garage with um, our ladder truck, was getting some work done on it, on a, uh, a specific device that was up underneath the, the ladder itself. So we had to have the ladder raised. Well, um, most people know that the, uh, the aerial truck has to have landing gears that go out to stabilize the truck. And those are absolute essential pieces of equipment when the ladder's raised and rotated. And um, he came to me as we were standing by at the garage waiting on the mechanics. And he said, hey, come help me with the ladder. And I said, okay. And, and I, I walked to the back of the truck uh, because this guy, I mean, I trust this guy with my life. And I asked him, hey, what do you need? And he said, hey, could you please help me override this thing so I can put the, 
you know, the landing gear up. And I look up and the ladder is still extended and rotated out to the side. And I, I said, Mike, what are you talking about? He said, I need to put the landing gear away. And I said, Mike, the ladder's extended. And I'll never forget this, like, this thousand yard stare he had when he, like, he was looking right through me. And I said, Mike, I said, you can't put the landing gear up. Okay, the, the ladder's still extended. And still, he had this almost like a thousand yard stare. Like he wasn't there. And it dawned on me, something was wrong. There was something going on at that time. And it was, it was potentially catastrophic because it was to the point where it was dangerous. I was on the hazmat team for 10 years in Tallahassee. And uh, we were actually, you know, kind of educated on the chemical side of things and what exposures and things might be on that end. But, you know, as far as structural fires, where you're dealing with, you know, this table, a mattress, uh, you know, the, the cabinets, you know, the, the uh, and also, too, you can smell, a, going back to earlier, you could smell like a kitchen fire. You could smell popcorn in a dormitory and go, somebody burned a pot. You know what I mean? So that's one of the senses. But, you know, going back to in, inside structural fires and everything, you know, once the once it gets serious, you're, you've got a mask on and stuff. Every fire is very unique in what it produces um, as far as the, the contaminants that are generated as a function of the fire. Uh, I've been to furniture fires where it was brand new furniture warehouse um, and there were a lot of acid gases uh, in that that were off gassing in that fire. And it was from the plastic wrap, I think, that went around all the couches and all the chairs. And the guys put their mask back on because as soon as they took their mask off, they had the acidic burning in their inside their noses and their eyes. So acid has a really good warning property. You're not gonna allow yourself to be exposed to acid gas, even in low concentrations because of the irritation that it produces in the human body. That was a Friday, that happened on a Friday. Uh, Monday, I had went to go get my physical and I was sitting in the hearing booth and she, when she was trying to test my hearing, she finally opens the door and goes, hey, I started a long time ago. Do, do you hear that? I, I didn't realize I had completely lost all of my hearing in my left ear um, from that, you know, from that day. Um, and, and I didn't notice. And the doctor said, well, were you around any loud noises recently or you know anything like that? And I said, well, at kind of an explosion on Friday. And she said, well, they, yeah, that will do it. Um, she said, it may come back because it's so, it's so new. Um, still, I, I don't have any hearing in my left ear. Lifting patients, moving patients, it can be very awkward positions. So even though you try to use good body mechanics like you're supposed to, it's not always going to happen. One of the changes I've seen is we are more aware of how to prevent back injuries and you know using more people to lift a patient, making sure everybody's has good footing before, you know, making a move. That's been helpful. Uh, in my case, it was, you know, just it was a wrong move. It was, it was something that just happened quickly. And the hard part was when I went home that next morning at the end of my shift, I had no idea that that was the last time I was gonna set foot in a fire station. And that was hard. That was really hard. Captain Lloyd Ray, he was essentially my hero, still is to this day. Uh, probably one of the best firemen that I've ever met in my life. Um, he had had some back pain for probably at least a year he had been dealing with. Thought he had hurt his back. They had him on light duty for a while. Couldn't figure out what was wrong with him. Finally, at some point, almost a year into it, they did a scan and found that he had kidney cancer. And by then it had metastasized and it was a little almost too late. I had buddies that didn't, it didn't, 
didn't make their career. You know, didn't they died? Accidents happened. Uh, we've actually, you know, probably one of the funniest guys in the fire department. Couldn't help but I hell, I'm smiling now just thinking about his face. Just as hilarious, you know. You know, tough guy. They ran around the dam. You know, we, you know, he exercise all the time and hunting and fishing and just living life just as happy as he could be. Never really saw him mad. And uh, he ended up with a rare form of cancer that could only be contributed to this. And we lost him. We lost him. Uh, you know, I mean, just one person's too many. What's really common is that firefighters tend to take off their SCBA after the fire is out. Uh, because they believe the threat is gone and I think the biggest threat lies with the contaminants, the chemicals that are off-gassing in the post-fire environment and I believe that there's a lot of exposures that are happening then because that is when they tend to drop their SCBA uh, because they're hot, they're tired, um, they take off their SCBA and finish the mop-up phase or the overhaul phase of the fire and uh, I think that's where a great amount of exposures are happening. I, I know quite a number of guys with cancer. That's, like I said, kind of what you expect. It, it almost feels like uh, a 50-50 thing as, as a fireman. You either get it or you don't. It turns out there's a lot of firefighters that get cancer uh, at West Palm Beach. Uh, I, I could give you names of about a dozen people I know that died, um, most of them before they retired. In fact, only one of them uh, after they retired that I can think of, but most of them were in their 40s and 50s. In my 15 years of uh, firefighting, I uh, obviously worked with a lot of people and I have seen a few people uh, have to leave the job, uh, either temporarily or permanently, um, for uh, presumptive health care reasons, whether it be cancer, heart and lung related. Um, some of them have come back, some of them have not come back, and unfortunately some of them have passed away. I've been teaching minimum standards for about 17 years now, and I started including some cancer awareness training uh, in our minimum standards classes. These are people that are coming off the streets, 18, 20, 30 years old, that I want to be a firefighter, and this is their minimum standard certification to become Florida State firefighters. And so we started teaching them at our, at our school, you know, hey, I'm a cancer survivor. This is an issue that you should be aware of. And then within a few years of that, the state uh, fire college in Ocala um, got together and said, we need to teach this to all recruits. So once they started doing that, uh, it's definitely now a part of a program, it's mandated by the state fire college that they have to have every recruit in minimum standards class has to have two hours of cancer awareness training. Well, a lot of things have changed over the years and, and every time you change, you change for, for the better, but you get worse stuff comes with it. You know, we went from cotton duck bunker jackets and just a pair of boots and a helmet and a pair of blue mule gloves to the, some of the best stuff in the world protects you now, the hoods and all that kind of stuff by the same Token, we've allowed building codes and construction to go down, and, and uh, I say it, but that weaker they, they crumble, they fall now more easy. The caustics, the stuff that burns now, they allow to go into these buildings is, is and it's deadly. Uh, I remember chiefs coming in a fire, you know, and and uh, one in particular, I was upstairs, came running down, and I had back then we had old tube, and I had the tube. They told us to stuff it in your jacket when your bottle ran out. And I could breathe, but I didn't want to breathe what I was in. And he came, came walking up the stairs. And I'm running down the stairs because I'm freaking out and out of air. And he's walking up the stairs with a cigarette. And he said, you find that damn cat? And I said, I'm going, I want to go get my bottle. I'm going to get him. I'm going to get him. I'm going to go get my bottle and all that. And he walked upstairs and found that cat. He didn't have anything on. He was in a white, a white uniform smoking a cigarette. He barely squinted his eyes, you know? So how could I, you know, how, how could I live up to that? Some of the things that, that we have out there and it's written documents, you can read them everywhere about rehabilitation centers on these large fire scenes, medical groups setting up and evaluating these firefighters when they come out. 
one air bottle, two air bottle, whatever they want to call it, and you go over there and you get a medical examination by a paramedic, and they run it, maybe even run EKG if they need to, and say, oh, your blood pressure too high, heart rate's too high, I hold you out. These, that's, that system's there, just they're not using it. And they, they need to use this, this will stop. One of them one killer's heart attack, it's on the scene. And I've been there, I've, I've seen one of my captains years ago just walk out of the door and fall down dead. So um, if, if they use this system, we can probably prevent a lot of that stuff instead of just that, go back in, go back in, change the bottle, go back in, change the bottle, go back in. There was um, another lieutenant and he, there was a house fire and it was pretty much gone. So we were hitting the outside of it with a, with a hose. And, um, and all of a sudden the hose got a lot harder for me to operate and my lieutenant uh, did not have an air pack on. And there was, you know, we were not inside the house, so I think he felt some comfort with that, but he was getting a lot, we were just covered in smoke. And, um, and he had a heart attack. Uh, he did survive, but uh, he could not go back to the job, so. The neurologists were stumped as to why his onset was so sudden and his decline was so rapid. So shortly after he got his uh, initial diagnosis of Alzheimer's in uh, August of 2016, um, he started having hallucinations in February and March of 2017. And then in another specialist appointment in November of 2017, he was put on palliative care terminal care, end of life care. So they basically gave up on him and said that there's nothing more that we can do. Uh, there's risk with every job. Uh, I think I think that we operate under the illusion we have our bunker gear and air packs on and so we're safe. Um, but, um, you know, obviously we weren't that safe. You know, we do get dirt and grime and smoke and everything that's in smoke. Um, especially nowadays. We have so many items made from artificial materials, plastics, polyester, so forth like that, that uh, even if you have an air pack on, it, it gets into your bunker gear and, and onto your skin. And uh, typically they do a decon process at the fire now. That's good. Uh, they give them a new set of bunker gear or clean and then get the other one clean. And they take them out of service for a while. When, when I was uh, on the truck, um, we would go to a fire and then a rescue call, no shower in between. Uh, I mean, I remember patients saying, you know, you smell like smoke. <laughs> well, it's just at a fire. It scares me more now than it did then. I, you know, when you're a young guy coming up, you're not thinking about what's going to happen to you, you know, where I am now at retirement. You know, so uh, really, I'm thinking, you know, more about it now that we're actually learning these things. And as I was leaving the, the fire service, we started getting, you know, tubes to go over the exhaust uh, as the engine goes out of the truck bay. Well, the engine went out of the truck bay and it blew on all of our the closet where we kept our bunker gear. It blew on the ice machine. You know, I mean, the filters would be black. With, you know, and then now they're, you know, so uh, the, the progression and the studies and the tests and stuff like that, you know, that are, that are coming out now as a, as a, you know, as a retired firefighter now, um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, man, if, 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 if all those things really do what they say they do and all that, well, then I'm, I'm doomed. I've been pretty healthy, uh, but after I retired, uh, actually just a couple of years ago, I had developed um, a cancer on my nose, uh, it's squamous cell. Uh, it appeared to be like just a red mark, and then it would turn white, and I just thought it was something like a, almost like a callus. And then I went to a new dermatologist, and, um, and she did uh, a biopsy of it, and uh, found out it was cancer. And, um, and was pretty alarmed by it. Uh, so um, I had to have it removed and it turned out it was a malignant tumor. 
that um, was successful, we hope. Um, and about a year after that, uh, oddly enough, um, my PSA and my blood test, uh, prostate, uh, prostate uh, specific antigen, the PSA, uh, started going up. It's usually like around two, you know, and, uh, and blood test. And it went up to three and then finally went up to six. And my doctor kept saying, you've got to get a biopsy. Uh, so I did that and that turned out uh, I had prostate cancer. I've been very fortunate in that sense. I know since even my hero, Captain Ray, and I buried him, I've buried many friends of mine, many fire fellow firefighters, uh, since even my diagnosis that I've watched unfortunately succumb to this horrible disease and um, it's disheartening, it really is. Um, I know I'm one of the fortunate ones. Uh, I believe in the power of prayer. <laughs> I'm standing here today because of it. Um, I remember the whole year that I was battling my cancer, when I was diagnosed, my children were, let's see, I believe 12 and 13 at the time. And I just remember praying every night that I went to bed, just let me live long enough to see my kids grow up and graduate high school. Um, and I always joke now because they've graduated high school and moved on in life that I'm on borrowed time. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I just, like I said, I just wanted to see them grow up and I wanted to, I wanted to finish that. There's a lot of research that link exposures to firefighter cancers a lot of research. I was one of the first to publish in 1998 on firefighter exposures that identify firefighters being exposed to carcinogens in the post-fire environment. And at that time, nobody was really listening, interested in listening to me. Um, you know, they, they did not want to hear that. And um, some of the things that my own department said is, what are we supposed to do? Just stand outside at the truck and throw water on a building? You know, like where's kind of where's the fun in that for the firefighter? They like to go make entry and, and do all the stuff that they're trained to do. I mean, that's that's exciting for them. That's the, the gist of their whole profession. I think when we 2000 and, uh... 19, I think it was the last of this. It was like a 191 firefighters took their own lives. You know, we didn't, if we had that back in the day, we didn't know about it. You know, information wasn't available as it is nowadays. So I think uh, that's one of the things that concerns me with, 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 with all firefighters, of course, you know, because it's a, it's a big family, but. With, with my, my guys and girls particularly, I try to watch out and watch out for that stuff and hope that I ask them the right question if they're feeling that, that they, they understand it. It's, it's okay. It's okay. I always think that, um, remember that guy's name, Josh something, wrote that song, Don't Go Riding on That Long Dark Train. It's for real. It's for real. I rode that train. That's why I know. And that's why uh, it's, it's very concerning to me in the fire service. That old chief that went up there, he never complained about, you know, something maybe bothering him or something like that, you know. Um, so I think, uh, you know, my first part of my career was absolute bliss. I, I was able to be around incredible men that raised me into the man that I am, you know. It's not just about fighting fire, you know, it's, it's like having a station full of uncles, you know, and a couple grandfathers thrown in, you know, and a couple that think they're your dad, but, you know, but uh, it's, it, uh, you know, you're, you're not just coming here and being a firefighter, you're actually being raised, you know, and there's so much here, you know, to learn and be a part of. Um, so, you know, I think in my particular situation, because I know not everybody's the same, and, and I was with so many guys that I still talk to today that can't even remember something that really bothered me. They only remember being on the call, you know. So it affects everybody, I think, a little bit different. I kind of came from the, the suck it up buttercup, kind of the end of that. So, um, and I didn't really, in full honesty, I didn't have very good coping skills 
resiliency skills. I just buried everything. And I did that for a very long time. Um, at least for me, it was a long time. And then about 2018 is kind of when I first started struggling. And what, how that came about, my wife actually tells me it started before that. But that's when it became very apparent. Uh, like I started noticing that I was, I was, I'd become very emotional about random things. So I would run like, you know, a nasty suicide or a fatal, you know, motorcycle wreck and I wouldn't feel anything. And then I had a toddler that maybe fell down on the playground and had a collie's fracture on his arm, something that's not life threatening, you know, at all. And it would almost bring me to tears. And I'm like, what is going on? Like, this is not, something's weird here. Something's not, not my brain is disconnecting with something. It should be the other way around. It is, it's crazy how things are in the fire service, especially if you live in the area where you work. Every street corner has a bad story. You know, you, uh, and you, your family don't understand it. You don't want them to understand it. My wife used to say, you don't come home and talk about it anymore. I don't want to talk about it. It's not that I don't want to share it. I don't want to put that in your head. You don't need that in your head. It's in mine bad enough. You ride down the road and you, you, you see a kid riding a tricycle and you think about a, a kid that rode a tricycle, it's like that into a pool, you know. Uh, cars, different things recap that stuff inside your mind. And in the, in the, in the fire services, it, we were extremely, extremely busy where I, where I worked. So one event never finished before another event started. So you never completed the thoughts from that event right there. And uh, in the years, you only stuff so much in a drawer and it's going to start coming back out, you know. And three shifts, three juvenile drownings, one per shift, and come home and a little, a little young in the last one wearing the same thing my son had on when I come home. And I talked my dad, I called him up at that time and said, Dad, I'm, I'm not doing well at all, man. I said, I, uh, oh, I worked with him when I was growing up, and he seemed to be able to handle that stuff, you know. And I'm like, how do you do that? And I found that bothered him too, equally. And that 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 helped me a lot to deal with that, to know that 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 it's not I'm, I'm not weak, I'm human. Uh, I think over a period of time, we we lose certain touch with our our emotional side of us, the the ability just to cry. It just numbs out in you after after a long period of time. I had uh, a stretch of events in my life where I found myself that I needed help. Um, I had I had uh, three um, it was three traumatic calls all within like it was like three or four shifts. Um, there was a there was a stabbing, there was um, uh, a teenager hit by a car, and there was a couple that got hit by a, a truck. Um, on top of that, my own personal life, I had many stressful things that also went on. Um, so I didn't take care of it. You know. I, I even knew better. I have a degree in psychology. I have a bachelor's degree in psychology, so I even understand how to go about it. But whenever it's yourself, you're like, no, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. Because in, in an individual isolated incident, I could deal with those things. In a perfect world, I wouldn't have outside stressors going on in my personal life. I wouldn't have other traumatic calls piled on top of that one call. But since it was all condensed into one to two months, it, it, it caught up with me, you know? The accidents were horrible and, you know, some, some tough stuff to, to look at and see. But the things that kind of got to me personally were, were intentional things, were, uh, you know, homicide, were uh, rape, uh, suicide, uh, domestic violence, you know, uh, people, purposely being burned to, to death, uh, those, those things kind of, you know, kind of, kind of knock away at your base a little bit. To me, it did. PTSD, um, most everybody knows about it nowadays. 
Um, stands for post traumatic stress disorder. Um, I tend to call it uh, PTSI for post traumatic stress injury um, because I truly believe that it's a invisible injury and not a disorder. An injury you can recover from, a disorder. Um, I'm not a scientist or a doctor or anything like that, but I don't believe that you can actually recover from a disorder. So I, I believe it's uh, doing a disservice to someone that has suffered the injury and uh, it gives them hope that you can recover from an injury and that's why I prefer to call it a PTSI injury. And have somebody talk to them, bring in a counselor, but you gotta bring in the right counselor. You can't bring in just the average person because when, when I had my event, they, I had an average counselor, just a, a mental health counselor, and she lasted about five minutes. And she left me. She said, I, 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 don't know, I, don't, I don't know how to deal with this right here. Uh, you don't want to be up here where I'm at, you know? We didn't have a lot on the books to do. We had uh, a Saturday inventory that we do, kind of really thoroughly look through the engine and, you know, do some little maintenance things and, and stuff like that. And, and uh, so we went to uh, behind the uh, Lowe's. Uh, you know, uh, hardware store to a nice big long stretch where we could pull off the hose and, and do that. And uh, in the middle of that, we got a call for a house fire. It was pretty frustrating for me because it was, you know, when, you, when you're when you an officer and you have a fire in your territory, that's your baby. You know, that's, that's my territory, this, you know, and so uh, I let them know on the radio pretty quick that uh, we were going to be delayed. And uh, we were getting real close to the neighborhood and everybody had said coming from the other side of town that they could see the smoke. It very clear, it was a burning you know, house fire. Knowing that they could see everything, I knew at some point I was gonna be able to see everything, but our vantage point just wasn't, just wasn't working like we wanted. So we actually overshot the neighborhood and they had gone in and uh, the uh, the acting officer on the now first due engine started you know screaming across the radio that they were shooting and there was an officer down and the uh, house is fully involved and they see the house from the end of the road so he's on the ra radio saying you know you got a house fully involved this and that now our jobs are changing you know all these things are information like I told you before so now I wasn't first due, now I was going to be catching a hydrant, you know, I had different duties and everything. So you're thinking about all that in your head. And he's seeing that house fire and it's, the roof's on, it's burning through the roof. So as they get closer to it, uh, he, they, at some point they realize they're in the middle of a gunfight. And a sheriff deputy is, you know, parked here and another one's parked here and the house is burning over there. And they look down and see a dead officer and a you know guy in a dark blue black robe shooting through one car into another car and another deputy by himself. Now he's you know behind his car and shooting back at him. And um, and actually an off-duty officer from his home went out, took his uh, his AR-15 out of his car, put his vest on, and and he ended up killing the guy. Um, and, uh, but they called us back in and uh, all this time I'm thinking, well, golly, what if, what if we weren't doing what we were doing, man? We would have, you know, we would have been there long before everybody, you know, this and that. But, I, you know, we still had a job to do. We went in, I told my chief I'd, you know, walk around every few minutes and make sure we were good. And he said that uh, he wanted um, both occupants of these houses out. You know, and so I went to the house on the right. My buddy went to the house on the left. And I asked the lady there, you know, listen, we're going to need to get you out. You know, I think I was holding her dog, and she was making a bag, and to put an older lady, she's putting a bag together and stuff. And she could go next door, and then, I, you know, next door said, sure, whatever. So we kind of getting together, and I asked her. I said, uh, you know, what, what happened here, you know, because we're, we're trying to piece all this together. You know, what, what actually, what do we, what happened, you know? And um, she told me that, that he, and I said, who, you know, who is he? And she said, well, him, the guy, that, the, the shooter, you know, knocked on her door. And he said, uh, my power's out, my phone's dead, my house is on fire, 
Call the fire department. And um, it seemed like at the moment that that I was like, I wasn't even there. I was like hovering above, and I could I could see this happening, and could see her telling me that. It it just it took my breath away and stopped when I started to think that of what was going to transpire if if we were at the station we would have we would have you know this this guy didn't want to kill a cop he was after us um you know my firefighter had a young kid the other firefighter had young kids i got three kids i mean you know th this officer you know gave his life and he's got kids and all these things going on and kind of got caught up in the moment and uh, couldn't help it but uh, something happened you know something happened as a firefighter you know no one wants to admit that they're scared they're you know nervous about things and obviously I mean we're firefighters look what we do I mean we don't we don't want to admit that you know we're we're concerned about stuff, you know, that uh, that we're facing. When we first pulled up on that fire, uh, I was definitely I was definitely concerned. I was concerned for our safety, safety of you know the public. Um, I, it's tough to say that I was that I was actually scared uh, because I've noticed one thing that uh, that I will do is I'll work through things despite how serious they are. And then I find out later, you know, later that, uh, you know, the things can affect me a little bit more. I got, I got to a point where uh, I found myself um, at an animal hospital uh, on the floor having an anxiety attack. I had no idea what was going on. And, well, I knew what was going on. I just didn't know why it was going on. Because in an isolated incident, I could deal with what had just happened. Um, so I get home, and then I have another panic attack. And I'm like, I'm on the floor. My wife walks in, and she's like, you, you got to go see somebody. And I'm like, I, I know. I'm, I'll call them tomorrow. And um, <clears throat> I just I knew that I needed, I needed help then. One of the reasons that I left Nevada County Consolidated Fire and went over to Cal Fire is because I had become a parent. And so responding to calls where kids were involved became very difficult for me. Um, I lost my father in a vehicle accident, a solo vehicle accident where he hit a tree. And if I had been on duty 20 more minutes, I would have been the first one there. So uh, I decided to step aside and take a uh, a position where all I dealt with for the last 10 years was wildland fire because with inmates you don't deal with any other people and so I had the opportunity to step out into a wildland role that I wasn't exposing myself to those situations anymore. I was the only battalion chief in the county and on August 27th um, I was responding as the second battalion chief uh, to a wildland fire. It was approximately 250 acres already it had burned down a half a dozen homes. And at that time, we had uh, two hell attack crews, which are helicopters with uh, firefighting crews uh, tied to it, working on the fire. We also had 10 air tankers uh, orbiting over the fire and making repeated retardant drops on the fire. And as these 10 aircraft were orbiting around the fire, uh, out of the corner of my eye, I saw another air tanker approaching that orbit pattern. Uh, exactly opposite of what he should have been entering into the pattern with. And as I turned and looked, um, he had a mid-air collision uh, with one of the orbiting air tankers. The pilot that he hit uh, was killed instantly. Um, the errant pilot's propeller went through the cockpit and sliced the innocent pilot. Um, the errant pilot's uh, tail broke off. The crash midair directed him, uh, turned him around, and he was hitting right at me. And so as I was running uh, to escape the soon impact, 
second slate. He impacted the ground about 30 feet from me, uh, blew me through the air, uh, crossed the road, bounced me off a big granite boulder, and tore my colon, um, and uh, caused a huge mushroom fire, um, set, um, set the surrounding area around me on fire. Uh, I curled up in a ball in the roadside ditch and uh, metal and body parts landed all around me. And um, the innocent pilot's plane flew on past me, impacted the hillside. And so now we had two additional fires uh, soon after every law enforcement agency in the, in the whole Northern Bay area started uh, arriving at the scene. Um, by then I was well into post-traumatic stress. Um, the arson investigator uh, was a good friend of mine and he tells me at the time um, that uh, you're starting to lose your the cheese off your cracker and uh, you're starting to whack out and you need to go out in the woods here. And, and he'd hand me a a big oak tree limb and I'd beat the hell out of a tree, kind of regain my my uh, senses and I'd go back to work commanding uh, the three fires. I had a really rough call. Um, actually, I just started here. And uh, um, I was uh, also volunteering when I was working here for the fire department. And uh, I worked, uh, volunteered and worked full time for the city. so. I uh, was working a lot of fires, and um, in 96, when I first got hired here, um, we got dispatched out to a fire and volunteer fire department, and uh, uh, people were trapped in the house. It was about 3 o'clock in the morning, and uh, we knew there were victims inside, and we knew we were going to have to make a really hard push to get inside and try to, try to make a rescue, and I was behind them, and we went in. And I'll never forget the fire pushing them out the front door. Um, one of the guys took the hose and you know started trying to knock the fire down so he could get in. And I crawled over the top of him and went in. And as I got inside, uh, I found the first victim. And um, I was yelling to the guys because I'd found the victim. And unfortunately, I knew that he was not, he was not salvageable. He was, it was just going to be a recovery. And I was screaming to one of the guys to bring me the hose because I could see, I could see the majority of the fire where it was at. And I knew if I had the hose in my hand, I could knock the fire down. Uh, and, and unfortunately, I just wasn't going to be able to rescue this guy. Well, one of the guys heard me and he brings the hose to me. And as the other guys are coming in, they find another victim. And they start making their way to the door with their victim as I start knocking the fire down. And we, we had an incredible knockdown on the fire, even despite the amount of flames that we had on top of us. Um, I remember I was getting burned on my, through my gear and on my back. Um, subsequently, I had uh, secondary burns across the top of my back. Um, but I left the victim where that I had found him and started knocking the fire down. And then as uh, I guess we started to make our way back out, we found a third victim. And uh, again, we, we evaluated that victim and knew that they were, um, they were not viable. So we left and um, came out. And I remember the heat had been so intense that, that I was disoriented and just had a hard time finding my way around. The guys that were with me, same thing. Um, I mean, some of their masks were completely, almost to the point where they were melted. Uh, their helmets were melted. Um, and we, we got outside and I immediately went to the paramedics to, and told them, hey, I'm burned, I'm burned. I said, can you check me out? And I knelt down and the guys were staggering. The heat was, was so intense. It's one of the hottest fires I'd ever been in. And um, as I, I finally I peeled my, I started to peel my jacket and my um, SCBA off and I noticed that I, had, I was covered in tar. Um, part of the roof had melted and poured tar all over the back of my, you know, my SCBA and my, my jacket. And um, I realized that it had burned me through my coat. And um, as I peeled it off, the, uh, the paramedic said, yeah, he says, you've got second degree burns across your back. It's already blistering. Hypoxia, um, you know, it's where your whole body is oxygen starved. 
and your cells are delivering carbon monoxide to you, so definitely you, you're gonna have some, some brain issues. And we had a um, supermarket fire. Fire was above them um, in the ceiling, and all of a sudden the fire came into their space, and um, the guy fell off the hose, so that was his pathway out, and he got lost uh, uh, in the fire. And he found a, um, a pocket to hide or, or, you know, to try to escape. Um, but what happens to your brain is you become hypoxic. Um, so your brain's not working right if you have an overexposure to carbon monoxide. So they were doing a search and rescue for him and they found him. And they said, here you go, here's the hose, just stay with us and we're out of here. Just follow the hose and we're out of here twice they lost him and he went back to his safe place so to speak um fell off the hose and went back and um they could not muscle him because he was a big guy with like three percent body fat i mean he was all muscle and there was just no moving him so he ended up succumbing to the fire all of a sudden this uh the scene just comes back to me you know it it uh it's it's as crazy as it sounds, it's this sweet old lady gathering her things, telling me something. And uh, and then remembering the shooter at the end, you know, with the, you know, they had him cuffed and uh, his robe was hanging off. You could see, you know, he'd been shot and, and uh, thinking that, I thought I knew what evil was, but this, this guy, you know, you know, how in the world could, could somebody, you know, do that? And how in the world could my crew and I be on his list? You pull a slot machine in our station, our, every, you know, we were first due to what his worst day is. And how, how can all that be possible? And, and, and knowing that we should have been there and then having guilt for the officer that's dead and, you know, going to his funeral and seeing his wife and seeing his kids and then I got to go home to my kids and all these things started going on in my head and uh, I didn't know, you know, if it was going to end. I didn't know if, uh, I didn't know, you know, it, it was it was different to me. Um, it had been months. Uh, and I started this kind of uh, I started this kind of Groundhog Day. It was like I would see images of him, you know, the sweet old lady, you know, uh, officer, you know, laying on the ground. I, I couldn't get away from it. Uh, I uh, spent the next few weeks uh, having dreams. I w can't even really. I mean, dreams can be pretty terrible. You know, at times and stuff, I, I had horrific things. You know, I, 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 I participated in things. Uh, it was like this, uh, this period of time. You know, from say one to three o'clock in the morning, that I couldn't, I couldn't get past that for weeks. I, I, I didn't sleep after that period of time. It was just seemed like it was one thing after another. Um, and then, you know, being the dang tough guy and all the stuff and being still going to work and being the, the officer and all that, you know, you kind of, you suck it up and you go, you know, and, and uh, you know, I'd wake up in the chair pretty much every morning for weeks, you know, I couldn't, couldn't sleep at home. I could sleep pretty good at the fire station. But when I got into the to real world to go home, it was, it was difficult. The station wasn't difficult. The job wasn't, you know, difficult. Uh, not having my cape and my helmet on and stuff was was difficult. Later, after that, we had a crit critical incident stress debriefing um, with counselors, and they came and spoke to us. and And I didn't realize the impact that that incident was having at that time on me, and even the, the guys that were with me. the uh, The amount of impact it had really. Um, during that debriefing came out. Um, I really got emotional, uh, started crying, and you know the guys were comforting me as well. Um, 
that was huge. I really needed that debriefing, um, you know, to, to figure that out. After that, um, for years, um, I would have nightmares about that particular fire. And that was, you know, that was 25 years ago. And it was surprising me that that stuff was coming back. I started getting a very short fuse. And then I stopped sleeping. And I've heard that from a lot of people. I sleep just started getting worse and worse. And it got to the point where in 18, I went almost six weeks, about 90 minutes a night. And that's, what's, that's actually what sent me um, to go get some serious help because you, no one can, you can't function like that. It was almost like I was stuck on, you know, talk about fight or flight. It was like my brain was stuck. It was stuck in that high throttle mode and I couldn't shut it down. Where my crew would actually joke with me because I'd be up at 2.30 in the morning cleaning the fridge because I couldn't sleep or I'd be on the treadmill. You know, I, I just, I couldn't turn it off. And all those things that came with it, that just that anxiety and that anger and everything was at this super intense state. And it just, I got to the point where I just, I was gonna crash. So that was, uh, I went in, started seeing somebody, uh, got help, took a big brick uh, or a big block off work about four months. I used my sick time and um, the department was, you know, they were supportive. They just wanted me to get better. And I even had someone say to me, they're like, hey, we, we want you to be better, whether it's, you know, you're gonna come back here or you're gonna go off and do something else. Like, we don't care. We just want you better for you, you know, for your family. And I thought that was, that was pretty cool. We have to realize that we are human. And people don't expect that from us. People expect the first responders to be the Superman, Superwoman type thing, able to deal with everything. And that's not the case. Uh, we have to recognize that it's not a weakness, it's a human trait, it's a good human trait, and figure out how we can incorporate treatment better. It's not something you can control. You, you don't set a schedule when you're going to have that nightmare. Um, you don't know what's going to, you know, what's going to trump that, that feeling back up, you know. Um, I had mentioned earlier, you know, that sometimes it's an odor. Um, sometimes it's a noise um, that you know that you might hear that that brings that that emotion back up. Um, the nightmares, uh, I'll, and I'll explain one of the things, one of the problems I had that that really drove me to seek help. Um, I would literally have a nightmare every night, the same reoccurring nightmare, and. I would wake up and look at the, the alarm clock next to the bed, and it was the same time every night, 3.43 a.m. I ran out of sick time. So all of a sudden, I'm like, shoot, I gotta pay the bills. So I ended up going into light duty, and any firefighter you talk to, probably all over the world, it's like the curse of death when you're stuck in the office. We're not built for the office. We're built to be out at the station and out on the streets. So that lasted a couple weeks, and I kind of forced the issue with the doc I was seeing. Like, hey, I, I think I'm good enough to go back online. And she was like, well, you know, do you, do you really think that way, or is this something else? And I'm like, well, I'm not going to know until I try. You know, I, I, I do feel better. I felt better, but I didn't feel by any means 100%. I could go do the job, you know, but I was still struggling internally with a lot of things. My wife basically gives me the ultimatum. You know, you got to get help, or you, you got, you know, you got to. Um, so I, I did. I, I called. I sucked it up, swallowed my pride, called the acting chief over our medical, told him. He sent me to EAP, Employee Assistance Program. You know, never wanted to know what their phone number was. Never wanted to be a part of that. Never thought that I would ever be a part of that and then I got kind of caught up in, in, in things and I had no choice. Uh, I wanted to do it for, it's funny because I didn't want to do it for me. I want to do it for everybody else and uh, they tested me, you know, all these different tests, two days worth of stuff. I ended up, you know, PTSD, major depression, borderline alcoholism 
it's kind of all the same little beast and uh, sent me to a, a PTSD specialist in town, uh, a woman with 40 years experience at the time and, and uh, I had a few visits with her. We did a little eye work, so e EMDR I think is what they call it, where you try to redirect you know, the images to, to, to a Tetris board that's not full, you know, so to speak. Uh, uh, a couple of those visits and I was, you know, felt a little bit better. I, I wasn't seeing it like I was seeing it, you know, and, and I had sleeping, I got doctor gave me sleeping stuff to help me sleep and, uh, you know, gave me some, you know, some depression type, you know, medication to, well, they would at anybody in a condition like that. And, uh, I did a couple of visits and I thought I was all right. You know, I thought I, you know, I got a little crutch. I could handle it from here, you know. Uh, I was wrong. I was very wrong. Uh, spent the next three, three and a half years uh, stumbling and fumbling, so to speak, um, getting triggered, you know, drinking way too much, taking pills I shouldn't be taking, uh, mixing them, uh, doing whatever I could uh, to cope. Uh, and, you know, I, I just, I didn't know what to do. I didn't, you know, I didn't know where to go. I, it was very limited, the people I could talk to because of people I didn't want to know that I was having problems and stuff like that. My family, they knew, you know, I was in, in bad shape, but they, you know, they're, I'm the, you know, I'm the, the dad, I'm the officer, I'm the leader. So, um, I could only imagine what my wife, you know, felt at that point because uh, she could see, you know, me deteriorating. Stopped sleeping again, started getting amped up again. That that familiar feeling that the second time, and that was in 2020. I'm like, I know what's happening right now. This is not my first rodeo. You know, at least the one blessing from that was that I, I knew it. You know what I mean? I knew it. So it wasn't the first time it was unfamiliar to me. Didn't really know it. Now I'm like, this is this is happening again. You know, I, I need to go get uh, I need to go get some serious help because I don't want to be like that. Um, and I just got to the point where I couldn't take it anymore, and that I had to do something. And it was kind of at my wits' end that I, I needed to get this stuff to stop. That you know, normal talking to someone you know wasn't helping. So that's when I uh, you know went a little bit further, and uh, you know I asked for some counseling and sat down with some counselors that were experienced in, you know, working with first responders. And, and that's when they told me, yeah, this is definitely, you know, you're, you're, you're looking at some, you know, post-traumatic stress here. And it, immediately I started noticing the difference, you know, just talking to them, having that, you know, that neutral person to talk to made a huge impact, a huge difference almost immediately started noticing the difference and, and wasn't having the problem so much. I ended up after about three and a half to four years coming across another call and uh, the same thing happened again. Uh, I went two or three months and then I ended up back in that living room, you know, with a, with a 20 year old kid that had, that had hung himself with a ski rope in uh, his grandparents' house. And uh, it's, it's, it's odd how this happens because it ends up that uh, in my world, it was just me and him, me, me, and that, me and that boy. It wasn't anybody else in my world. I, I don't know how to explain it. It was just a constant, you know, he never woke up and tried to hurt me. He never, he never nothing ever changed. I just kept standing there in that room with him. And uh, my nightmares started coming again. Started having a lot of issues. And uh, my wife, had, she knew something was up again. And all I did the first time was double down. You know, I knew that I had to hide it better. I had to hide, you know, my drinking more. I had to hide everything because I didn't want to let everybody down. I didn't want to let that chief down that went up the stairs. Um, 
it's foolish to say, I mean, but it, it just, it just kind of is, you know, that way. Um, and so uh, I had a bad night, had a horrible morning, and uh, I ended up in a real bad place. And uh, another person that I had, you know, spoke to that was really experienced with, uh, unfortunately, with post-traumatic stress, um, was a soldier, a really good friend that was a soldier and had uh, done a couple tours and was having a lot of issues. Um, just sitting down and talking to him was probably, I would have to say, was one of the things that definitely uh, impacted me and changed, changed my, you know, my life. I'll, I'll put it that way. He, uh, he literally, he literally saved me. So I really can, you know, I really have to credit that, you know, that guy with sitting down with me and talking to me made a, made a huge difference. In one of the first fires I went to, I was eight months on the job and it was a pawn shop fire and two young men went in there. They were 15, 15 and 17, I believe, and poured gas on the man and, and uh, you know, said, give us your money. And, um, and I think he handed over the money, but as they were leaving, the youngest one, he had a, he had a torch, um, just out of means, threw it threw it on the guy and killed him, you know, burned him. He was still alive when we got there. And uh, he, uh, it was, uh, I, I remember thinking, this is so cool, this job, I was maybe eight months on a job, and then I saw a guy burned to death, and he was still alive. He was asking us to kill him, because um, he, he was in a lot of pain. I don't know, um, you get connected to these stories and, and they tend to stick with you for a long time. It was called the West Coast Post Traumatic Stress Retreat, uh, and that is a seven day program for uh, cops, firemen, paramedics, dispatchers, any of the first responder category that suffers from post traumatic injury. And uh, I was in class number two um, um, at that time uh, in the fall of 2001. Um, there were only two of these locations in all the United States. One was in Worcester, Massachusetts, and the other one was there in the Bay Area. And uh, I was fortunate enough to get a slot in there, and uh, um, at the end of those seven days, I was driving uh, up the street to my house, and my wife happened to be looking out a big picture window, um, not knowing, but looking at me as I approached, and uh, she knew something miraculous had happened because she said as I was driving up, she could see the whites of my teeth because I was smiling that big. And uh, they had brought me back from the brink. I actually, uh, I regret, you know, that day, but I can't take it back. Um, that day it felt easier to, uh, it felt easier to just not finish the day um, than go through another day with with me and this and this boy, it wasn't. It was. I wasn't. Uh, I can't say I wasn't thinking about my wife, my kids, my family. All I can say is that that's the only son of a bitch I could see. And uh, I couldn't. I couldn't do it where I was. I was in. I was in town, and I uh, didn't know who to call. I texted a good buddy of mine that wasn't in the fire service. And I thought how horrible it would be for, for my guys, especially the guy that uh, would have been first on scene based on the, where I was and, and the, uh, the shift it was. So I decided to head to South Georgia where nobody would you know, know who I was and uh, you know, my guys wouldn't have to see me. And that friend of mine texted me back and I pulled over and he pulled in and I I gave him my gun, I gave him the alcohol I had in my, in my truck, and I, uh, I left. And I, you know, he started chasing me, and he didn't know what was going on, and he knew that I'd had some problems, but he didn't know that what, what day I was in, you know. Uh, you have good days, bad days, and that was my last day. So I took off 
for a cotton field in South Georgia, and uh, I had to make a decision, you know, if I was going to try to do all this again. I knew how hard it was. It took me three years to get over the first one if I was going to be able to do it again. And uh, I talked to people that weren't there. I wasn't hallucinating or anything. I was just, you know, I wanted to, I wanted the officer to know that I did what I could. I wanted everybody to know that. So I ended up uh, deciding to go back and get help and, and and try to do this. Try to try to win. You know, it was it was beating me. I don't like being beat. Uh, I didn't have any control. Uh, that was the scariest part. Is that that here I am in a cotton field and, and I don't I don't even know how the hell I got here and and. Uh, so I went to my therapist, actually an emergency visit that day, that afternoon, and uh, kind of set me on another path. And I, you know, had to let her know, I had to let my family know, I had to let everybody kind of know what I was going through, although still keeping it from the fire service. And uh, that would have been uh, August or so of 2018. And I made it to May of 19 uh, on the engine. Uh, when I went back, I was in such bad shape that her recommendation was I immediately had to get off of the engine. And I said, well, that's, that's not going to happen. We've got to figure something else out because that's my life. That's what I do. I'm good at that, you know. Uh, they didn't pick me for spelling bees. They picked me for, you know, if something needed to get done, that crazy, you know, he would, he would do it. Um, that's been my whole life. But uh, that was my spot at the table. That's 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 who I was. You know that was. Uh, so I uh, in May I had a uh, another call that was a CPR in progress, and it was it was bad. But what are you gonna do? You know, you you know, did, we did everything we could do, and and uh, I knew that was my last call. I I you know I been given advice for months and months by friends, family, a physician, um, kind of started the process for, you know, getting out, so to speak. I was still suffering, still seeing uh, my therapist five days a week, and, um, and my wife uh, worked at the local junior college, and she went to work, and uh, I, I was obviously off duty, and uh, um, I didn't realize it, but after she went to work, I went in and uh, pulled out a pistol that I had at the house and uh, completely disassembled it, cleaned it, put it back together, loaded it, cocked it, stuck it in my mouth. Um, honestly, totally unaware of what I was doing. And um, I have to assume my subconscious was telling me to blow my brains out um, but fortunately um, um, my God um, allowed me to feel the pain of that front side of that pistol as I stuffed it in my mouth and it split my lip and the pain was so excruciating it woke me up and uh, I realized what I had come very close to doing and um, so I uh, took the ammunition out and uh, locked it in, a, in my gun safe and uh, I walked four and a half miles out to my wife's employment and uh, surprised her by being there and uh, the physical activity helped me enough to have my, my uh, shit together and uh, I handed her the key to the gun safe and said don't, don't give this back to me until uh, my therapist says it's okay to do it. And, uh, so that gun was locked up for at least a year and uh, the therapist finally said, you know, you're recovering enough. You can go back to target practicing and those types of things and not be a, not be a hazard to yourself and, or anyone else. And um, um, so that's the depths of uh, post-traumatic stress. Um, the mind is such a complicated organ that uh, I didn't even realize what I was doing until uh, that pain hit me. And um, so, um, 
you know, you got to reach out and ask for help before you even get to that point. But that suicide thing, I understand it. But, um, what people understand is, you know, they say, why did why did they do that? Why they why would they do that? You know, the the pressure is is so immensely great with within you. Uh, I'll, I had dreams I couldn't even protect my own children. I'd be from here to here and they're drowning. I can't even reach them. These dreams and uh, when, when the, the thought of uh, taking your own life enters your head, it's a happy thought. It's the craziest thing. You're happy. It's like you just all of a sudden breathe again. It's like, oh, that's the answer, perfect answer, no doubt about it. It's all good. And, and if you don't, something there don't snap you back, man, you, you're going to do it. I was, I was fortunate. I was very, very fortunate. And uh, now I view things a lot different once I did. But that's one of the things we need to take care of. We need to take care of this. Those are, oh, these are preventable things. These are preventable things. Like I said, building construction, these are preventable things that we're allowing to happen in this, in this fire service. We're allowing to build buildings. You see them, there, even if nothing happens to them, five years are falling apart, you know. What do you think they're going to do on top of somebody? going inside these structures. We're having to put these big old red emblems on the sides of these buildings and let them know the construction shabby. It's going to fall on people, you know. It's a, the, I, I just said a long time ago, the, the, the building construction codes are going to kill more firemen than, than fire. Not, you know, holes through walls and all these more and more acceptable measures. Not much, much higher risk. I ran out of time. And, uh, Knowing that I was running out of time, everybody was kind of getting together and trying to figure out what we're going to do, you know. I'm fixing to be leave without pay because the doctor says I can no longer do my job. I know I can't do my job. I could do my job. I just can't, you know, I just can't sleep and, and deal with it. But uh, so I'll never forget the, the, the city's attorney asking me, uh, or are you still getting paid? Are you still getting your benefits? And I said, yes, sir. And he said, but you just got through telling me that you ran out of time, you know, two months ago, whatever it might be. And I said, yes, sir. And he said, explain to me how you're still getting benefit in, you know, your, your health care and your pay and everything. And I said, uh, and this is, a, this is a tough part, too, because uh, I said, well, my, my guys stepped up. And they're helping me. And he said, "What does that What does that mean?" I said, "Well, they're they're working my shifts for me." And uh, he said, "Well, who approved that?" You know. And I said, "Well, the fire chief approved that." You know, I'm, I don't I don't have a choice. You're not you're not you know I'm not getting help, and and I'm I can't you know. And uh, he and he said, "Well, how long can that last?" And I said, "Sir, I don't know. I don't know." People that apply become a firefighter. Then there's the ones that love the job. And I always say, blessed is the person that goes to work every day that loves their job. I'm, I love my job. That's why I'm still doing it. I've retired and I'm back in it again. I love, I, I love doing this job. I, um, for a long time, it was like you're trying to catch up. You try, you, you, you've lost. And, 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 and the personality and the, and the makeup of, the, of, the, of a true firefighter don't accept loss. We, we, it's just one. It's part of the nature. We can't. So we're always trying to catch up. You know, uh, we, we lost this person. We're going to catch up. You're never going to catch up. Uh, 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 that's one of the reasons they do it. It's just always trying to. And you always think that. And you know that. You know, when you, I can make a difference. You know, even and I'm up in the years now, but I, I could. If, if you save one life, if you save one life, you know. If you can make a difference in one family, you know, it's 100% worth it. Every, every bit of it's 100% worth it, you know, just the, the, by making the right decisions and stuff. And when, when you get up in the years, there's a pile of knowledge in your head and pile of information that could be used. It's a shame that, that once it gets to a, it's like having a, I hate to say I'm a bottle of wine, but a good bottle of wine, right when it gets ready where you can serve it and it's good, then you put it on the shelf and never use it. It's a, it's a shame. A lot of that goes away uh, when you lose these guys like that. You know, when they walk out the door, you millions of dollars tied up in them and they walk out the door and just nobody says a word, you know.
I get to go and help people and, and solve problems and fix this and fix that and do what I can for, for, for strangers, you know, for the rest of my career. This is, you know, you guys are going to pay me and then I get a retirement, you know. I know I was supposed to do that, you know, so, so I'm, I'm supposed to save people, you know, but my question kind of got to be at the end, I'm supposed to do that. Who, who's supposed to save us? Who's supposed to save me? I had so many friends that have said, I don't know how in the world you do what you do, you know, and then I, I got toward the end of my career and they would say that and I'm thinking, I'm falling apart right in front of you. I'm falling apart right in front of you, but I can't say, I can't tell you, you know, I can't. I can't tell you, you know, uh, um, I just, you know, I just want, you know, everybody to, you know, try to be more cognizant, try to, try to, you know, try to do better. And I, th and I think we are, I really think we are. I don't, you know, I mean, I, support is so huge, you know, my wife and kids, my, 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 my family, my, you know, my, my sisters, I've, I'm the, I'm the baby boy of three sisters, three older sisters, um, um, you know, they got involved, you know, and they, you know, they helped me, you know, and they helped me to make decisions and, and stuff like that, but, uh, you know, I don't, I don't want, people to go, ooh, there's fireman, I wonder, you know, if he's all got mental problems and blah, 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 this and that. You know, you don't want that. Um, but I, you know, I, I, I think we need to, you know, this needs to be, as well as the, the smoke and the carcinogens, the, golly, the washing your bunk. I mean, there's so many things. One of the struggles I had when I was going through it, and this may resonate with some guys, is, I'm like, why me? I'm like, I haven't been on that long. You know, 18 years, 19 years, you know, some service prior. I'm like, you know, where I know guys that are 35 year vets that have seen double, you, you know? I'm like, why is it affecting me? And that makes you feel weak and question yourself. Well, the answer is that there is no answer to that. Everybody's an individual and we all have our limit of what we can get, you know? So you can't compare yourself with other people. I had that conversation with the guy that I got connected with who was a younger firefighter, struggling. And so ashamed that he was struggling at, at, at not very long you know, on the job. I'm like, it doesn't matter. It does not matter, man. You're struggling, let's deal with that. You don't, don't compare yourself. And it was, a, it was a success story because he did open up and was supported. And everything that I was praying would happen for this guy, happen. People want to help. But you have to freaking be vulnerable enough, you know, to, to, to speak up about it. I love my job. I've always loved my job. I tell students when I teach now, even given everything I've been through, divorce, cancer, all that I've been through, I, I wouldn't, I would do it all again in a heartbeat. I would go through it again. Um, it's been the best choice I ever made to become a firefighter. It was never on my radar growing up. I wanted to be an architect. <laughs> How I got here is a long sort of story, but it's something I fell in love with. Um, I feel like I was just meant to do this. I, I feel like I was created by my creator to do this job. Firefighters are not disposable. Firefighters do this job because they love the community, they love the public, and they love helping them. So when they need help, you can't turn your back on them. I don't know any of us who wouldn't do it again. You know, we all have that drive. And I, I'm, I'm sure Mike wouldn't want to be where he's at right now, but I'm also sure he wouldn't change a thing. He'd, he'd still be a fireman. Yeah. It's one of the few guys that, that got into the line of work that he was made for, you know. So, and he's helped a lot of people along the way because of it, so. You don't wanna go, the, you don't wanna go where I did. You know, let me, let, let me be the example. Look at, you know, look at, look at the mess I created, you know, and look how I've tried to unravel it, you know, and look at, I'm, 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 
I'm shining a little bit on the end of this. I'm shining a little bit, you know. Look at, you know, look at, uh, look at me as an example. Not being afraid to, to go get a checkup. Not being afraid to, go, ask for help. Um, understanding that it's okay not to be okay. I think as first responders, we have a lot of a hero complex. We have a lot of, you know, I can fix this and, you know, type mentality. Um, it's always, because I mean, that's what, that's the mentality that we have showing up on scene. Like I can fix this, I can help this, I can do this. Because if you don't have that, then you're in the wrong line of work. Um, so I think getting over that hurdle and a lot of times that's how the family views that person as well. Well, they can, they're, they're okay. They're fine. And then whenever they're not fine, they don't know what to do. So encouraging your loved one to go get checked out, to go, you know, get checked up and talk to somebody I think is so important. It's a very noble profession. People really look up to us. And, uh, I, you know, I want to try to, you know, make, I want to be that person that people are able to look up to and ask, you know, for uh, advice and for assistance. And uh, I definitely, a lot, of, a lot of times I feel that way and it makes you, makes you feel good. So um, definitely do it all over again if I had to, even despite the, you know, a lot of the nightmares, um, the injuries, the injuries are another, you know, thing. Um, some of the things that I've had happen to me, I, I had to have surgery because I, I got a hernia rescuing someone. Um, I've had multiple bouts of, you know, cancer. Uh, don't know what, you know, they're attributed to, but even still, you know, wouldn't change, you know, wouldn't change a thing. So, um, definitely the best career in the world. One of the most rewarding jobs in the world. And it's okay not to be invincible.